Good afternoon. My name is John Strope. Welcome to History Nebraska's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. Lectures are held on the third Monday of, or third Thursday of every month in uh, the Old Father Family Auditorium here at the Nebraska History Museum in downtown Lincoln. Learn more about History Nebraska and our programs and services at history.nebraska.gov. If you are not a member of History Nebraska, I encourage you to join. Your support allows us to provide programs like this brown bag lecture series free for all Nebraskans. For a full list of membership benefits, visit our website. Special thanks to the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast these programs across the state. We'd also like to thank LNK-TV, a service of the City of Lincoln, which produces these programs. If you would like to watch previous Brown Bag Lectures, there are over 170 on History Nebraska's YouTube page at youtube.com slash History Nebraska and look for playlists. Our topic today is the Roaring Road, Nebraska auto racing in the 20th century. The automobile went from curious fad to essential tools in the early 20th century. Soon, tin lizzies were roaring across Nebraska via county fairgrounds, from Omaha to Gehring and hundreds of points in between. People such as Plainview photographer Harold Mock built, raced, and documented the sport through the 1950s and 60s. This brown bag will examine the auto sport in the state and the role Mock and people like him played on the local racetracks. Our speaker is Bob Mays. Bob is a research tech at the Speedway Motors Museum of American Speed. He has been a racer, photographer, researcher, journalist for Flat Out Magazine, and author of six books about auto racing. He is on the board of directors for the Nebraska Auto Racing Hall of Fame and in June 2018 was inducted into the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame in Knoxville, Iowa, the highest honor which can be awarded in the field. Just to let you know about asking questions, Bob says to ask them anytime. Please join me in welcoming Bob Mays. Well, hi everybody. Um, we're going to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's car racing in the state of Nebraska. Um, and to get started on this, we really need to go back before even the first auto race to maybe the first car. Um, I believe it was uh, Carl Benz was credited with uh, inventing the automobile in the 1880s. Um, and there's an old saying that the first auto race happened shortly after the second automobile was built. <laughs> That's a bit of a stretch. It's not literally true, but it's pretty close. I mean, um, car racing started very quickly. And to examine why racing became so important, especially early in the 20th century, we really need to go back to the 19th century when the car was still very new. And there were three things that, that really had an impact. Uh, one was horses, two was other car builders, and three, and I think every wife in the audience can, can vouch for this, boys will be boys. Um, now to examine those each individually, uh, you may not understand why horses uh, were an important part of the automobile and automobile racing, but they were because in the late 19th century, horses were the main way that people got around. Horses, bicycles, and on foot. Um, so when cars started showing up, when automobiles started showing up, it was a big deal because anybody here who's ever owned a horse understands that uh, horses are a, are a little bit flighty, especially around things that make loud noises and smoke and generally wreak havoc with your ears and your eyes, and that was the early automobile. Um, so a lot of people that owned horses were very much against automobiles. 
And this, this is kind of interesting because I think we all know somebody in our lives right now who is, let's say, anti-computer or anti-cell phone or whatever it is. Well, the automobile was the emerging technology during this time. It was, it was the computer of that age or it was the cell phone of that age. And so there was a lot of pushback. Um, in fact, as, as cars became a little bit more common, they were still a novelty and a lot of people viewed them as a fad and a passing fad. Um, and they, were, they, they became more common in the big cities, but uh, you got to remember the United States was mainly rural. It was an agricultural society back then, around 1900. And so what happened was a lot of small communities started passing regulations to control automobiles. They, they put uh, special speed limits. They couldn't go more than five miles an hour in town. They had to always give the right of way to a horse or a horse and buggy. And some communities outlawed cars in town, said you can't have them. The, the livestock just can't handle this stuff. Um, so the auto manufacturers needed a way to present automobiles and put them in a positive light to show them that this emerging technology was, was going to be just fantastic. So they started racing. Uh, the other thing was there were a lot of guys building automobiles in these days. It seemed like everybody was, was putting together cars and trying to sell them. So there was that race on Sunday, sell on Monday attitude too. It was, it was com competition not just on the track but in the showroom. These guys wanted to sell cars to people. And then of course the third one was everybody that built a car wanted their car to be the fastest and the best. It's the, you know, uh, that competitive thing, you just, you want to beat the other guys. Boys will be boys, and that's what boys do, right? I, yeah. So, these, these, were the, these were the things that the automobile manufacturers were up against. And uh, the county fairs with their horse tracks, once again, we're in, we're in battling the horse people. Those horse tracks seemed just a natural venue for racing. Um, so anyway, um, there was, there were a lot of these horse tracks around and uh, um, the car people wanted to use them. County fairs were, were going strong and a lot of times they would be able to schedule an auto race for the last day of the fair. There were also a lot of driving parks around and Omaha had a driving park. And that's actually where the first auto race in Nebraska occurred and this was on August 23rd, 1904. Now there may have been some races at some county fairs before that, but this was the first organized big race that was held in the state of Nebraska. And they really couldn't have done any better with their participants than what they did. Um, as you can see, they had Barney Oldfield, A.C. Webb, Webb J., and Fred Winchester. Now I don't know if, if you folks uh, have heard of any of these guys, but there is one guy that I think most of you have heard of, and that's Barney Oldfield. And going back a little bit on Barney, he was a bicycle racer in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And he had an opportunity through Henry Ford to drive Henry's first race car, the famous 999. And he did so well with that car that uh, his sponsor, a guy named Tom Cooper, bought the car for for Barney and he went out and started doing demonstrations. This is actually what got the Ford Motor Company started. Um, it, was, it was a big deal for Henry. Henry retired once Barney took over the car and he was nearly unbeatable with this car. Well, it didn't take long before Barney was uh, being courted by other builders as well. So by 1904 he, 1904, he was driving a car called the Peerless Green Dragon. I love cars that have names, especially ominous names. And, and the Green Dragon was just an, an awesome name for a race car. Um, so Barney showed up at the Omaha Driving Park with this car. Now, when I first was doing uh, research on this, I thought perhaps the Omaha Driving Park later became the Exarban Field. Well, it didn't. The Omaha Driving Park was actually in East Omaha, uh, what is now called the Near North Side, um, and it's no longer there. It's a housing development now. But anyway, they brought these cars in, 
And, you know, another thing about cars back in that age was that they were a bit fragile. They were always breaking down. So of the four gentlemen, the headline gentlemen they had for this race, only two of them showed up, and that was Barney and Webb J. Now, Webb J also had a car that was rather famous. And here's Webb. His car was called Whistling Billy. Not quite as ominous as the Green Dragon. Uh, but this was a steam-powered car, which steam-powered cars were pretty popular back then, too. And, of course, they called it Whistling Billy because when it got going, it literally whistled like a tea kettle. Um, but on August 23rd, these two guys faced off at the Omaha Driving Park. 23,000 people showed up. And, of course, Barney Oldfield set a world record and won the race, and everything was great. And uh, that was part of what made him later, they, they named him the master driver of the world. I don't, I don't know a higher title that a car racer could get than the master driver of the world. And of course there was the famous thing that uh, as, as cars became more popular and, and of course the kids started speeding with them, the, a cop would, would pull a car over and, and he would say, who do you think you are, Barney Oldfield? Um, so anyway, Barney was really the first superstar of racing. Um, Webb J did very well, but he finished second on this day, so that was that deal. Um, my next slide. People always ask me, Bob, how do they come up with some of the nomenclature that is part of auto racing? And uh, of course now if you watch any auto race, they'll talk about drivers coming into the pits for service. Well, where, how did they come up with that name? It's just a word. Well, it's not just a word, because very early on in most uh, uh, repair shops and whatever, there was literally a pit in the middle of the floor so that the mechanic could get under the car and work on it from the bottom up. And in some auto race tracks, there was also a pit. Now, you'll notice uh, on this one, you'll see most of the guys are in the pits, and the driver and the riding mechanic are actually working on the car. I'm not sure what, what's going on there, but anyway... Uh, that's where the term the pits came from, and it's just something that has carried over uh, for a long time since then. It's still, still being used. Um, now, as we went along, Nebraska, uh, after this 1904 race with Barney Oldfield, more and more county fairs started having races, and at the very top end of the sport, a, a uh, organization called the AAA, that's the American Automobile Association, most of you may know, that they uh, give roadside service and they hand out maps and do other travel things. Well, they saw that auto racing was a very disorganized situation. And of course, they had a, a stake in, in the success of the automobile as well. So they started overseeing racing and they, they were the top level of the racing uh, organizations at that time. In fact, there really was, there was no organization. It was AAA in, in the United States. Um, and what they saw on these county fair tracks, there were no lights, um, the, the tracks were built for horse racing, so there was very soft, sandy tracks, and when the cars got out there, in addition to all the smoke the cars generated, they also generated a lot of dust. So they came up with this idea, a guy named Jack Prince, who was a bicycle racer, and he had built several bicycle velodromes, the wooden speedways, eighth of a mile or whatever, and he went to AAA and said, you know, I think we can build a larger version of the bicycle velodrome for automobiles. And that's how the board track era started in the U.S. And Omaha actually had a board track. Technically, they didn't because it was actually in Carter Lake, Iowa. But it was really, it was owned by the city of Omaha. The city of Omaha paid for the track and it was called Omaha Speedway. Anyway, they had one of these huge board tracks. It was a mile and a quarter in length. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of feet of boards they used to build this track. Uh, but it was just a huge place and high banked. Uh, for instance, Daytona International Speedway, one of the most famous tracks today, has 33 degree banks. These board tracks had upwards of 40 degree banks. And this is 1915. Um, and as you can see here in the picture, it shows uh, uh, the turn and the straightaways. Uh, the, the Omaha track held about 15,000 people. Um, and it was, 
a, a spectacular, really it was the birth of the super speedway in, in America. Um, unfortunately, as, as you can probably guess, building a track out of wood probably wasn't the best idea in the long term. Uh, the Omaha track lasted for three years, and that was pretty typical of all the board tracks, and there were board tracks all over the country. Uh, Salem, New Hampshire, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, Los Angeles had several tracks, Tacoma, Des Moines, Kansas City. Um, there was a track in uh, Fulford, Miami that lasted one race, and the day after the race it was hit by a hurricane and turned into kindling. Um, but typical of these, these wooden tracks, the first year was great. Everything was brand new, the track was fantastic. These guys would go upwards of 100 miles an hour on these cars that on a dirt track would typically, they'd struggle to reach 60 miles an hour. And uh, they would just be flying around. The racing was great. Uh, it, was just, it was just an extraordinary experience for everybody. Then you had a Midwestern winter go by. And the second year, you know, the, uh, the shine was off the pumpkin a little bit. The tracks had some soft spots. Uh, the drivers had to be a little bit more tentative. Um, in some cases, the tracks started breaking up a little bit. In fact, there was, there was cases where a guy would come in after practice or after the race, and they'd actually have pieces of wood stuck in their face that was thrown up by the other cars. Um, so it wasn't quite as, quite as great an experience. Then you had the third year. Um, and the third year was generally a complete disaster for most of these tracks. Uh, Omaha, in fact, in 1917, its, it's final year, uh, it ran a race on July 4th, and it's considered the worst board track race in history. Um, the boards actually started breaking. There were holes in the track. There were, there were stories, I don't know how true they were, of carpenters during the race actually trying to patch holes in the track while the race was going on. So if you know that game Whack-A-Mole, can you imagine doing that at 100 miles an hour, uh, driving down the straightaway and seeing some guy poke his head up through a hole in the track? It's just unbelievable. Um, but the tracks were spectacular when they were brand new. And uh, it's, it's been theorized, I've got a friend of mine who, who thinks that most of the houses in Council Bluffs and Eastern Omaha and Carter Lake area are probably built with wood from the Omaha board track. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, it was a spectacular era of American racing. Now the track in Kansas City, this is, this is getting off the subject a little bit, but this is just such a fantastic story. They built a board track in Kansas City, and they built it on an old swamp. And apparently they were in a hurry, so they didn't get the pilings down all the way to solid rock. And the drivers said that as they were racing around this track, the track would wave, and they would, it was imperative for them to get on top of that wave, almost like a surfer in the ocean. <laughs> because if you got off the top of the wave, you were going out of the racetrack. So that track only lasted two years. I don't know. I don't know why that was other than surfing just wasn't that popular back then. I don't know. Anyway, um, in 1915, a big event happened um, that had, it had a big uh, impact on my life even though I wasn't born until 1953. But that was the very first race at the Nebraska State Fair, September 8th. Um, and it, it's interesting because the star of the show was none other than Barney Oldfield, who by this time, he was, he was up there with the top sports stars in the world. He was world renowned, Barney Oldfield. And uh, they scheduled this race. A new organization had just come about called International Motor Contest Association. And uh, Barney was part of that promotion. The interesting part of this race that he was in was that it wasn't strictly a car race, it was a car versus an airplane race. <laughs> now, if you think back, the airplane was also a very new technological marvel. Uh, the Wright brothers made their first flight in 1903. 
And so people were very curious about these things. Uh, how fast can a plane go? How low can it go and not crash into grandstands? Um, how does it match up against automobiles? Um, well, Barney and Deloitte Thompson is the guy in the plane here. They ran a series of match races all over the country. And I am happy to say that Barney won this match race at the Nebraska State Fair. He didn't win all of them, although I, I suspect Deloitte Thompson had a better chance to do a little cheating in these races than Barney did, given the inside rail uh, that, that Deloitte could kind of circumvent that. But I don't know if he actually did or not. But uh, anyway, it was, it was a spectacular show, and uh, it was great that they came to the Nebraska State Fair. Now, they also ran regular races at the State Fair during that time, and the very first race was two days after Barney made his debut on September 10th, um, and that was uh, a regular IMCA show. And uh, this is a picture from the Nebraska State Fair. It's very interesting. You can see the big crowd, and you can also see the reason why they tried to build all the board tracks, because there's a lot of dust. There's actually eight cars in that race. But it's, you know, there's another old saying in racing, if, unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes. And that's, that's very definitely what we have here. Um, it was a great show. Uh, a guy named uh, Alex Sloan was the promoter of these races, and he promoted all the big uh, uh, races in the country that, that were uh, uh, part of the uh, state fair circuits back then. And uh, he brought his own cars, usually brought them in on a train car, unloaded them to a lot of pomp and circumstance, and uh, was just very... Uh, very much a showman, and uh, uh, so these races were very popular. There were 30,000 people at the first race for the Nebraska State Fair, and it kept on going right up until uh, 1977, the last race at the State Fair. Now that was kind of the national part of racing in Nebraska, but there were a lot of local racers that were also uh, very significant, and this is one of them, a guy from Oshkosh, Nebraska named King Riley. And as you can see, King was, was uh, a very meticulous person. Here he is with his uh, uh, Hudson race car. See, it's very nicely done, very nicely detailed out. This is actually at North Platte, Nebraska, a big race. Um, and he's wearing a white suit. He's even got a bow tie on if you look real close. Uh, he started racing in 1912 and raced up to the mid-20s, late 20s. Um, very good racer, won a lot of races. He won the 1921 Pikes Peak Hill Climb, which was a big, actually an international race at that time. Um, so, so King was, was, was really the king of racing in, in Nebraska at that time. He did have one challenger that was quite significant, and that was this guy, a guy from Madrid, Nebraska, named Noel Bullock. Now you'll notice right away a little bit different presentation here. <laughs> Uh, Noel wasn't so much about the visual. Um, number one, he had a what they called a Tin Lizzie race car. Um, Henry Ford started building Model Ts back in 1908, and they were the kind of the the common man's car. Um, and and these guys started building these things into race cars. And Noel was one of the guys at the forefront. Uh, this was a very very fast car, even though it doesn't look it. And uh, he was a big rival of King Riley. I'm going to go back. You can kind of see the difference between these two guys. And you can understand why they're rivals. They were virtually the, the same speed on the racetrack. Uh, they both won a lot of races, and they did not like each other. Um, especially probably King did not like Noel. I, just knowing, we all know people like this in our lives, people that are very meticulous, very detail-oriented, and then we know other people that just, they don't care what it looks like as long as it works. And, and that's, that's King Riley and Noel Bullock. Um, they both, like I say, were, were dominant in the era of the 20s. Uh, they both raced against each other a lot. Noel Bullock won the 1922 Pikes Peak Hill Climb with this very car. And an interesting part of that was he actually drove this car from Madrid to Pikes Peak mm -hmm. 
raced it at Pikes Peak, and then drove it back home. So, uh, you know, the auto laws were a little bit less stringent back then. You know, there wasn't this, you got to have fenders, you got to have lights and all that kind of stuff. Um, basically, if you didn't run over a horse, you were, you were pretty, pretty much okay. So, anyway, Noel Bullock, um, I, I just try to think back how these guys' shops looked. I'm sure, Noel, you went in there and it was a big mess, stuff just piled everywhere, and he was probably the only guy that knew where everything was. King Riley, on the other hand, probably had his tools hung on the wall, very neat, very orderly, uh, very clean, um, and, and probably didn't allow anybody to touch anything in, in his shop. So it just this this type of stuff if you if you like the human interest part of the thing it's it's really it's really interesting to study these two guys cuz on the racetrack they were virtually the same <laughs> so very much two different ways of of going about things um here's another guy that was a a tough competitor back in the 20s his name was Tom Garrett and he had a brother named Earl Garrett and they both were racers they were from Franklin Nebraska and uh, they helped build a mile track in, in Franklin that was a big auto racing track. I believe it opened in 1922. Um, but in 1923, Tom went to a race in Sturgis, South Dakota and was killed in that race, unfortunately. And it really had an effect on Earl, but Earl also had a responsibility to this new track in Franklin. So he kept racing. Now a little backstory on Earl. Uh, he was also the sheriff of Franklin County. And uh, Franklin County in the 20s, as I think a lot of counties in the 20s, had, this, had a little problem with guys making uh, alcohol in their basement or in their back, back behind the fence or back in their backyard or whatever. And so he had to enforce the law, which was that these guys had to stop doing that. Um, they were called bootleggers, I believe. They usually had a still and they sold outlaw hooch to all their friends. So there were a lot of guys that, that were not happy with Earl. A lot of the population, not just, not just the, the makers of this stuff, but some of the consumers of it too, I don't think liked him. There was also another group uh, in, in Franklin County that was uh, even a darker group, if you, if you want to say that. And they came to Earl, and they asked him if they could use Franklin Speedway for one of their events. And he said no. Uh, the group was the Ku Klux Klan. And so now Earl had made enemies of the people uh, running the stills, and he had made enemies of the Ku Klux Klan, which at, at that time, it's, it's just like today. You don't really know who who were your enemies and who your, were your friends. Anyway, they, had a, they were going to have a big race at, uh, at Franklin, and Earl was in that race, and uh, he was going through turn one, and all of a sudden somebody heard a loud pop, and his car went out of control, and he was killed. Unfortunately, racing was kind of dangerous. The funny thing is, was that when they, when they got to him, they took him directly to the morgue and people started looking at his car and there was no damage to the car. Everybody kind of assumed that he blew a tire and that's why he went into the fence or the engine blew up or something. But there was nothing wrong with the car other than the damage it suffered going through the fence. So uh, when talking to some of the old timers at Franklin, there were some of them put forward the, uh, the idea that maybe uh, Earl Garrett was assassinated, unfortunately, and, and of course there's no proof. Um, when, when I tried to go to the, the uh, county seat in the Hall of Records there, uh, they didn't have any of the death certificate or anything of Earl. Those had disapp disappeared somehow, so there was no record of what he actually died from. But uh, anyway, it's kind of a sad part of Nebraska auto racing history, but it's, it's a part of history. Now this next gentleman was from Beatrice. His name was Troy Pig, and uh, he, was, he was a pretty good racer in the, in the 20s. And he was also a manufacturer. He built 
fuel pumps along with his uh, partner and, and fellow racer, Harry Gage. But the reason, the thing that makes him significant is not necessarily his auto racing career, but the fact that he may have been one of the first victims of road rage in the state of Nebraska. Uh, 1936, this was after he retired from racing, he was driving down a Beatrice Street and uh, he bumped into the back of, of another car. Uh, and it happened to be a co-worker who he had had problems with uh, previously at work. And they both got out of their car. And, you know, in 1936, cars had big steel bumpers and there really wasn't much damage to either car. But anyway, uh, these two gentlemen got into a, an argument and uh, the other gentleman pulled out a gun and shot po Troy Pig right in the street right there and killed him. So... Uh, another unfortunate thing to happen in, uh, in this sport. Uh, this next guy is an interesting guy. This car was uh, from Dorchester, Nebraska, and it was uh, built by a guy named Henry Sennert. They called him Heine because he had kind of a thick German accent. Um, and his driver was a guy named Chris Peterson. Now we know quite a bit about this car because, and I don't mean to plug my place of business, but since Clay is here, I kind of have to. We have this car. <laughs> we have this car in the museum. This is the the S7. It's up on second floor. We've got it in a garage diorama. Really neat piece of equipment. But Chris Peterson is really the interesting story here. Um, he was the driver and helped, I'm sure, with the maintenance and everything. But Chris's dad was a. Uh, a manufacturer from DeWitt, Nebraska, and he came up with this fantastic tool called the vice grip. And uh, Bill Peterson was his name. And uh, Chris raced this car, and I'm sure they probably used a vice grip on this car several times. And Chris was a pretty good racer, but then he went on to uh, uh, run the vice grip company after his dad retired. So very interesting uh, situation there, how racing actually helped industry in Nebraska. And of course, Vice Grip became a very big deal and then it got sold and now I think it's being manufactured in China or Georgia or somewhere. Um, another interesting racer from Nebraska were the Volberal brothers from Dwight, Nebraska. And this is their shop. And this is a pretty typical mid-1930 uh, race shop. Uh, you can see the equipment. There's a race car there in the foreground. Uh, the overhead line shaft drive for all the equipment. I'm sure uh, they probably, well, OSHA didn't exist then, so they didn't have any problem. But if OSHA had existed, they probably would have got a visit from them and said, hey, you got to put some guards over these things. But uh, anyway, um, just a kind of a typical place of business for the for the local racers. They actually owned a, a Ford dealership uh, or a Chevy de I think it was a Ford dealership. Um, Chevy. It was a Chevy dealership. I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, that's that's the Volbrals. Now one of our fellow Nebraskans who made it big on the national stage and even the international stage was a guy named Earl Cooper from Arborville. Um, Earl grew up in, in Arborville, which is up, I believe, west of Columbus and north of David City or up in that area. Um, anyway, he moved to California and his first race was very interesting because he was working for this uh, auto dealer. This was in 1909 and they had arranged a race, a local race, and the, his boss was going to run in this race. And he thought that would be pretty cool. And this lady who had just bought a car uh, asked him if he would drive her car in the race and he said yeah sure I will well his boss got wind of this and said no you're not you're not driving in the race I'm I'm in this race you can't you can't run in it so Earl quit his job or got fired uh, whatever and he won the race so if he didn't quit he definitely got fired <laughs> um, anyway he went on to race Indianapolis he, he uh, was on the pole at the Indianapolis 500, 1924, I believe. Uh, finished second in the race at one time, never won it, but uh, he, was, he was really a major player on the national stage, was a very good board track racer. Um, 
and, and had, a, had a very long career for that almost 20 years that he was in the sport, which is very unusual because most of these guys, the average career was five to 10 years. It was, there was a lot of attrition within that sport. Um, the car is also very interesting. Uh, this, is a, this is a Miller, uh, which was a top of the line car in the day. And it's interesting because in 2008, I had the opportunity to go with Clay Smith and Bill Smith to an auction where this car uh, was sold. And to just let you know how valuable these cars have, have become in later years, this car sold for $1.8 million. Uh, and that's, that's it at the auction right there. It's just a beautiful creation. I'm sorry to say we did not get the car. <laughs> sorry, Clay. <laughs> but, you know, everybody has a budget, so. Um, you know, the guys had to, uh, once, once auto racing became established in the country, the guys had to promote it somehow. Well, how do you promote an auto race at your local county fair? Well, you get yourself a great big banner, you bolt it to the top of your car, you put some streamers on there, and you drive around. And you let everybody know that there's auto races coming up. Uh, this happens to be Clyde Baker from Ord, Nebraska for the Valley County Fair. And this is his personal car that he drove around and uh, he did a pretty good job of promoting the races because most years they had a full house. Um, and here you can see this is, this is the result of all that promotion. This is actually at Ord and they've got the grandstands are full and the racetrack's full of race cars and everybody's having a great time. So. Um, sometimes there were there, yes, sir. What was the approximate era of the photo of the Ord? Uh, the approximate, this photo here, uh -huh. this was actually, I believe, 1947 was the year of okay. this photo. So, um, backing up just a little bit, uh, this picture is from the Nebraska State Fair, and it's this is a picture that I really enjoy because I lived similar to this picture. And uh, so I was a bit of a track rat when I was younger. And of course, when you're a kid in the 50s and 60s, you didn't have any money. So you had to think of other ways to get to the racetrack. And I would sneak into the Nebraska State Fair and then I would peer over the fence. This is an interesting picture because as you see, the two adults are looking through the slats in the fence, but the two kids they say the heck with that. We're climbing over and really getting the show. So, um, some of the other famous drivers that came through Nebraska. This is a picture of Joey Chitwood, who is probably more famous for his thrill show than his auto racing career, but he was a very good auto racer. But I kind of wonder if this picture, which happened at Ord, wasn't the start of his thrill show. <laughs> uh, he obviously has a little mechanical problem there, but uh, as you can see, if you look closely, he still looks like he's fully under control of the situation. Um, this is another picture from Ord. Ord was actually, in the uh, 30s and 40s, probably the most famous racetrack uh, in Nebraska. It was a high banked half mile, very fast, had a lot of very famous drivers uh, race there. And this is a, uh, a show of uh, the guy in the front is uh, Morris Music, then there's Johnny McDowell and Joey Chitwood, Lloyd Axel and Sam Hoffman, who were all big stars back, back in those days. And they're all running right there together at Ord. Uh, interestingly enough, also, three of those cars were mechanic by the same gentleman, Chelsea Johnson from right here in Lincoln, Nebraska, who ran the Antelope Park Garage uh, over on 26th and Randolph. And, uh, uh, you know, that was really one of the first super teams in Nebraska racing. Now here we come back to the Nebraska State Fair. This is 1932. This was when the old brick grandstand was brand new. And as you can see, it had a pretty good debut. Full house um, from top to bottom. Um, the big 5 8 mile was, was one, of the, one of the big fair circuit attractions even back then. So uh, 
as you can see, I'm, I'm, I always look in this picture to see if my dad was in there. He would have been seven years old at the time of this picture. But uh, I haven't been able to uh, figure out. He was probably looking over the fence in one of the turns, I would imagine. <laughs> now then, you wonder, when you're at the racetrack, how do you fix the race cars? You don't have that pit necessarily in, at every track. So what you do is you just get some of your friends and you lift the car up and you work on it. The interesting thing about this picture that I've noticed is there's really only one guy that seems to be holding on to the car. Um, so, anyway. Um, racing could be a bit dangerous back in those days. Uh, we did lose a lot of guys, and that's one of the reasons we have the safety uh, things that we have on our daily cars today, uh, such as seat belts and uh, uh, structures that help the car in rollovers and, and shatterproof glass and stuff like that. But uh, in the 30s, the, the big full-size race cars were, were kind of having a tough time. As you know, in the 30s, nobody had any money. So it was, it was tough to put a racing team together. As a result, a new type of racing started, and that was called midget racing. These were three-quarter scale full-size cars, and they became tremendously popular um, right off the bat. And, and there were midget racetracks popping up everywhere. And the thing about midgets were you could race them virtually anywhere. You could race them on a full-size track. You could race them in a cornfield. You could race them in a baseball stadium. You could race them on a, on a high school running track. And they, and they all worked very, very well. Um, one of the, the interesting things, now this is a car from Wichita, Kansas. Uh, the driver's from Wichita Falls, Texas. His name was Lloyd Ruby. Now why do you say, why is this car in a slideshow about Nebraska racing? Well, I'll tell you. In 1947, uh, the owner of this car, Chet Wilson and Lloyd, went to Ord, Nebraska, and they swept the show. Won every race they were in. Subsequently, Lloyd, uh, puts together a pretty good racing career. And he actually ran the Indy 500 like 17 times and almost won it twice. Every year he was in the Indy 500, the entire town of Ord would, would congregate in the town square and listen to the radio broadcast rooting for their hometown boy, Lloyd Ruby. Even though he was only there for three days, uh, they, they still remembered him from those days. The other reason I'm showing that picture is because I own that car. So. <laughs> Midget racing got so popular that guys actually started buying multiple cars and hauling them around. Uh, and this is, this is a neat picture of, of the Lloyd Axel team, who also raced at Ord in the 50s, uh, with his two-car team. So anyway, guys, auto racers were, were among the most... Uh, uh, they, they just could do stuff that people wouldn't even think of doing, you know. And, and this double stack trailer was one of those things. You got to get two cars to the racetrack, you only got one tow car, well, let's figure it out. Um, this is another guy that had a two car team. This is a guy from Omaha named uh, uh, Art Jacobson, and he had a long career as a midget racer, very successful career as a midget racer. Probably the first. Nebraska car owner that was a superstar in midget racing. Um, another guy who was a big time midget racer was Otto Raymer. And along with his driver, you see him here, Bobby, Bobby Parker, they were from Omaha. And Bobby Parker was probably the first big time superstar midget racer in Nebraska. Um, these two guys made a very formidable uh, team now, midget racing got so popular that a guy named Frank Curtis out in California started building cars pretty much on an assembly line. The problem with that was that the cars were so good that everybody started buying them and the racing got duller as a result. Everybody had the same equipment, everybody had the same cars, it got very hard to pass. And so midget racing kind of went on the decline. And so as a result, a lot of midget racers started stretching their cars into sprint cars, and sprint car racing made a big comeback. Here is a typical uh, midget that was stretched into a sprint car. It has a Chevy V8 in it, and you see the, uh, its logo was the Mighty Mouse, 
once again, this car was owned by Chet Wilson and uh, raced here at the Nebraska State Fair and all over the country. But it was pretty typical of, uh, of what the guys were doing back then. Um, another type of racing was, was called roadster, roaring roadster racing. And here we see a couple of uh, uh, roadsters racing against a sprint car. Now, in post-war America, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon because what happened was uh, everybody wanted to buy a new car. And when the auto manufacturers got up to speed again, uh, everybody wanted the newest car possible. So there were a lot of old pre-war cars that were perfectly good cars, but they were sent off to the junkyard. And uh, uh, so the Roaring Roadsters was a product of that. There were all these perfectly good cars. And uh, so guys made race cars out of them. Boys will be boys, you know. Um, they raced at, at the Nebraska State Fair, became a, a bigger event than ever. And here you see uh, an overhead view of the track. I, I just love this picture because it kind of says something about what the Nebraska State Fair was in the 50s really a, a major event. And then here's a ground level shot of, of the same place that uh, that's kind of where I grew up right there, right behind that fence there coming out of turn four. Now some of the cars that, that raced at the Nebraska State Fair back in those days, this is probably the most famous and here again I said earlier I love cars with with names and this car was the Black Deuce. It was probably the most famous car of its day, still one of the most significant race cars in the history of sprint car racing. The uh, driver was uh, named Bobby Grimm. Uh, the car owner was a guy named uh, Hector Honore. And uh, this car was just a very dominant car of the age. Um, here's one of its competitors. This was the Offy Killer. Uh, Chet Wilson was the owner. Harold Leap was the driver. And it was really the first successful Chevy engine car uh, back in the day. Now we talked about dust earlier. Uh, in the 50s it was still kind of dusty and you still wanted to be the lead dog for the same reason. Um, and here's another picture, that same deal just back in the pack a little further. Um, it, was, it was a tough way to make a living. This picture I just put in here because I don't know how many of you went to the races at the State Fair, but who remembers the little Jeeps, uh, the little National Guard Jeeps that they used as push cars? I just, I love those things. It was, anyway, here we got, this is about 1960. Now this is an interesting picture. I put this in uh, for kind of personal reasons. This, was, this is another a uh, car with a name. This is Old Yeller and it's just knocked down the fence at the Nebraska State Fair. Well, about 10 minutes before that car knocked down that fence, I was looking through a knot hole in that <laughs> section of fence and somebody drove a big truck and parked it about 20 feet down so I climbed up on top of that truck for the next race and here comes Old Yeller and knocks that fence down. I was heartbroken because there was a, that knot hole was just at the perfect place and that's all I could think of was now they're going to put up a brand new fence. There won't be any knot holes in it. Um, back then, the junkyards were the speed shops for the whole country. And like I said, a lot of pre-war cars were involved in racing. Um, the roadsters became very popular for a short period of time. And then after that came the modified stock cars, and this was, this was a deal uh, where Harold Mock from Plainview was one of the leaders of this type of racing. These cars were virtually everywhere, and in this picture you can see Harold, he's on the outside in the number 711, just going for broke, and uh, these races just were tremendously popular back in the day. Um, here's a picture from, I believe, Wayne, Nebraska. Uh, here again you see the big crowd, county fair, uh, the cars. You'll notice most of the cars have very ample uh, bumpers on the front. That's because the radiator was the most important part of the car. Uh, if, if you had a damaged radiator, you weren't going to be in the race for very long. Some of these cars were very well done, very nicely detailed. It's kind of the King Riley, Noel Bullock thing. 
uh, even more extreme. Um, <laughs> the one thing you'll notice with this car is the radiator still in good shape. Um, that's what's important. These cars were slam bang, bounce around, they'd crash. Uh, very few injuries resulted from these. Usually the, when the guys signed in for racing that night, they made sure their tetanus shots were up to date because when you're crawling out of the car, that was the most dangerous part. <coughs> and it was fun racing. Uh, this, this is just a fantastic picture. Here a guy has just crashed his car and yet he's posing for a picture. You know, he, he seems very proud of that thing too. There's a little kid at the front saying, hey mister, you know your car is upside down. Um, some guys weren't lucky enough to land in a place where they could get their picture taken that readily, but they were still more than happy to, to pose for a shot. Um, so anyway, after you crashed your car, you had to fix it. And uh, the local garage was always filled up with race cars. Most gas stations owned race cars uh, back in the day. And uh, uh, here we see a, a gentleman. This is actually Harold Mock's car again, uh, using a, an old tree stump as a, uh, uh, to hold his car up so he can work on it. Some of the superstars of modified stock car racing. This is a guy from Edgar named Gordy Shuck, a very successful driver. Um, from Omaha, you had Bud Burdick. This car was, was really an iconic car. It was a V8, yellow, um, very fast all the time. From Sydney, Nebraska, you had Curly Doggett. He was one of the top guys out west. Central Nebraska had uh, Wilbur Heckey from Holdridge. Uh, he was definitely one of the top guys. And from Hoskins, you had Gerald Brueggemann. Uh, they called him Boog. Um, had a very long career, successful career. Now here's a picture for John and for Clay. <laughs> this, is, this is probably the biggest star in Nebraska auto racing in the modified uh, era and, and really for any era in, in my book. This is Speedy Bill Smith with the Speedway Motor sedan. His driver was Lloyd Beckman who I was deathly afraid of back in the day. This, he was he's so mean looking. I mean, there he, he even looked, he even looks mean. <laughs> anyway, great, great racers. Uh, these guys, you talk about meticulous preparation. These guys put it all together. Um, with this particular car, uh, they won 16 features in a row out at Capitol Beach Speedway. Um, in fact, it got so bad, Speedy Bill told me this story that he actually put a smaller engine in the car in order to finish second, because he had he owned a speed shop, Speedway Motors, so he was selling parts to the guys he was racing against, and they were all mad at him, and they were he was losing business because he was winning so much. Well, Lloyd found out about, about the smaller engine, and that made him mad. He drove the car even harder and just kept on winning. Um, <laughs> But finally, it all worked out. You know, the other guys just had to step up their game. But even though they did, this car was still always dominant. Uh, it raced for about four years, and it was always the top dog. Uh, everybody knew what the back end of this car looked like, I guarantee you. Um, as far as stock car racing is concerned, there was one major stock car race in, in, in Nebraska, NASCAR what they call, I think they call it the Xfinity, Xfinity Series now. Um, July 26, 1953 at North Platte, Nebraska, they had a, an Xfinity race. Jim Rathman, or Dick Rathman, I think was the winner. Uh, 5,000 people showed up. It was, it, it was a very big deal. Um, but that was the only one they had. I don't know why. Um, for some reason, they didn't come through anymore. Now the modified stock cars in the 60s started evolving into super modifieds and uh, some of the guys just took the bodies off to lighten the cars up. Other guys would actually build special cars that were more like sprint cars, but they had cages on them. Uh, this happens to be Johnny Rutherford, coincidentally, a guy who uh, ended up being a three-time champion of the Indy 500. Uh, this picture showed how the modified guys had trouble keeping up with these new generation super modifieds. Uh, they really had to drive the cars hard and as a result, 
they really didn't last that long before everybody had to switch over to the newer, smaller cars. And these cars kept evolving, becoming more and more like sprint cars. And uh, so it really, it really changed the face of racing. One thing it did was it made it a lot more expensive. Um, and the cars became actually caged sprint cars. And uh, uh, the one thing that happened, uh, and I'm gonna quickly go to this gentleman here, Kenny Greitz. Um, he won the, the Knoxville Nationals, the biggest race in sprint car racing in 1969. And uh, later that season, actually 16 days later, he was racing at the Nebraska State Fair. Uh, and they made him take his roll cage off. If you'll notice, he's got a four point cage there. Same car, no roll cage. And unfortunately, he was killed uh, at the Nebraska State Fair. And what it did was it, it changed sprint car racing so that uh, everybody had to then run a cage. And this was a national thing. He became a martyr for the roll cage, um, unfortunately. So racing has continued. Um, and here we have, this is just an interesting picture. I was here at this race. Thad Dozier's the driver, and he had Jimmy Dean, who was performing at the uh, uh, races that night, uh, came down and presented him the trophy. So, pretty neat deal. Any questions? Nobody has any questions. I must be explaining this pretty well. I've, yes? I've been interested in this stuff since I was in single digits. And one thing I've never figured out or read anything about is the pump on the outside of the, the early sprinters. What, that, what the function of that? Well, uh, that was they didn't have mechanical fuel pumps or electrical fuel pumps, so you had to pressurize the fuel tank. So that's what that was. That was just an air pump that pressurized the fuel tank. So they had to do that every, every couple minutes. Yes, sir. Bob, tell them how they started sprint cars before the Jeeps pushed uh, them off out of the state fair. Well, um, the, the way that they started sprint cars back in the old days was that uh, the guy in the back of the truck would have a rope and they'd, t they'd roll the rope around the front axle and give the, give the end to the driver and then they would pull start them. And the guy in the back of the truck, once the car started, the driver had to let go of that and then he had to make sure to wheel that rope up so that the car didn't run over it. So. Well, with that, I think we're just about finished. I've been getting the uh, the one to go sign. <laughs> Green, white checkered, yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming today. And uh, is any more questions, real quick? I guess that's it.